Ward 5C is a children's medical ward. It is generally a well-run and efficient place. But there occurred here a small outbreak of streptococcal infection which, for one reason or another, was allowed to spread. Four main people were concerned and we can meet them right away. Firstly, this is Derek Mackay. He is suffering from a congenital abnormality of the heart. The nature of his disease is bound to make his recovery long and slow, even if no complications set in. In the next cot is Helen Medway. She's in hospital for treatment of primary tuberculosis. Helen's making reasonable progress, although it'll be some months before she's clear. There doesn't seem to be much wrong with Jimmy Miller. He's been having treatment for acute rheumatism, but he's practically well now. And Dr. Blake is the fourth character. He really has no business to be on duty at all today, because he obviously has a bad cold. As it turns out later, it's not only a cold that he's got, but also a streptococcal infection of the throat. No doubt he himself would rather be off duty, but they are short-staffed in the hospital, and there's no one else to carry on. At the moment, he's dropped into the ward on Jimmy's account. He's very pleased with the little boy's recovery and sees no reason why Jimmy should not leave hospital in three days' time. This is good news indeed. Jimmy will be home for his birthday on Thursday. But when Thursday comes round, Jimmy is in no shape to leave. He has a sore throat and also a slight temperature. As a matter of routine, a swab is taken of his nose and throat. And sister tells his mother when she rings up that Jimmy will have to stay in hospital until he is recovered from this slight setback. He is firmly told that he must be a good boy and stay in bed until he's well again. It's impossible to isolate him in a cubicle, they're all occupied. But as a measure against cross-infection, Barrier nursing is introduced, with all the technique of gowning, masking, hand washing, and individual equipment. Meanwhile, the swabs from Jimmy's nose and throat are being cultured in the laboratory. But presently, the little boy gets bored. Splendid isolation is not for him. And further down the ward comes a clear call for action. Of course, Jimmy is hustled back to bed quickly, but unfortunately, nobody saw the little episode with the toy. Three children, all infected by the same type of organism within a few days of each other. How did it spread? Let's go over the events again and see if we can pin down each step and examine it in detail. It looks as if Dr. Blake was the culprit in bringing the infection into the ward in the first place. With his medical knowledge, he certainly had no excuse for not wearing a mask. Now we're going to try an experiment with Dr. Blake. We've got here some fluorescent material to represent bacteria. We can hardly see it in ordinary light, but in ultraviolet light, it glows quite brightly. If some of this is put into a syringe, and the syringe is attached to a long piece of rubber tubing, it's possible to deliver a continuous supply of luminous drips to the inside of Dr. Blake's nose and throat. If we now ask Dr. Blake to repeat his conversation with Jimmy, luminous material will be spread in much the same way as the streptococcal infection was spread, and we can trace its path throughout the ward. As he speaks at close range, 
Fine particles of fluorescent material are blown out from his nose and throat. As he sneezes and coughs, Jimmy is enveloped in a spray. When bacteria are carried in a similar spray from the nose or throat, it's known as droplet infection. If Dr. Blake had worn an efficient mask, the bacteria would have been trapped. In ultraviolet light, the outside of the mask doesn't show any trace of contamination. It's all been caught on the inside. That's why it's dangerous to touch the inside of a mask, for fingers may become contaminated. Once a mask is used, it should be dropped into a disinfectant solution. Well, that's one way in which the streptococci may have entered the ward, by droplet infection. Even though Dr. Blake was obliged to come on duty, the least he could have done was to wear an efficient mask. Our next link in the chain is Jimmy. A few days have gone by, and he has a temperature and sore throat. And the infection has produced a heavy concentration of bacteria around his nose and mouth. His hands, his toys, and bedclothes are all contaminated. He's told to stay in bed, and is being barrier nursed. But not a bit of it. Presently, he's up and off after Helen's duck. It's only a matter of minutes to pass on some of his contamination to the toy. And via the... This type of infection is contact infection. It's the sort of thing that happens so easily in a children's ward. One has every sympathy with the staff. Of course, if Jimmy could have been isolated in a cubicle, this might not have happened. But what guards are there against contact infection when isolation of the patient is just not possible? Well, to start with, here is a telltale piece of tape hanging on Helen's cot. All toys for small children should be tied on securely so that no amount of tugging can work them loose. Any toy that does fall to the floor is bound to pick up bacteria of one kind or another. The technique taught in each hospital eventually becomes a matter of routine to skilled nurses and all members of the ward team. But for nurses in training, it may help them to imagine infections as visible contamination. Each one to be strictly guarded and confined as if it were the plague.